Good morning, everybody. Um, I want to welcome everybody to this morning's uh, virtual session with Turnstile Tours. Uh, my name is Andrew Gustafson. I'm going to be your host today. Um, so we're going to dive right in. And so um, first, what I'm going to do is give you a little bit of background about the Naval Cemetery. Um, and then we're going to bring Danielle in and uh, we're going to have a conversation with her um, because she is the coordinator of the Naval Cemetery landscape for the Brooklyn Greenway um, initiative. But we want to give you a little bit of context about the site, um, especially for folks who haven't been there before, or maybe you have been there before and you weren't aware um, of this site's really incredible history. Okay, so first um, to um, let you know where exactly we're gonna be talking about today. Um, so this map shows the um, Brooklyn uh, Greenway, which Daniel will give us some more details about the Greenway itself. Um, but here at, there's two maps. So on the top, um, you can see from left to right, that goes from Greenpoint um, down to Red Hook. Um, and you can see the light gray area in the center is the Brooklyn Navy Yard where that red circle is. So the uh, Naval Cemetery landscape sits on the southeast corner um, of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And then on the bottom, you can see um, where the uh, Brooklyn Greenway continues um, down through uh, Red Hook and the Sunset Park uh, waterfront. Um, and here it is in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, so again, in the southeast corner where that red circle is, and you can see that pinkish area down there, that is um, the extent of, the full extent of what is called the Naval Hospital. Um, so a little bit about the, the hospital. Um, this is the building, um, if you've ever seen it before. Um, this was constructed in 1838, and it is a, a New York City landmark. Um, so the building currently doesn't have anything inside it now, um, but we'll talk about the future plans for this building. But no matter what happens, the building is going to stay there because um, it is a New York City landmark. Um, so the Naval Hospital, um, this property was actually acquired by the Navy back in 1824 um, because there was a desperate need for the growing Brooklyn Navy Yard um, to have medical facilities. They did have um, a small infirmary and hospital on the other side of the yard, but the whole Brooklyn Navy Yard is basically built on a swamp. Um, much of the yard is, is landfill. Um, and so they found um, back in the 1820s that whenever there was high tide, there were six inches of water uh, inside the hospital. So not exactly sanitary conditions. So they bought this land um, to the east uh, of the yard um, that was up on a hill. Uh, and so they bought the land in 1824, and then by 1838, the hospital building you see um, in this picture from 1857 uh, was, was completed. Um, and so the Naval Hospital served um, the Navy Yard from um, 1838 up until 1948, so for 110 years. Um, and as we talked about last week, um, if you missed the ses session about inventions of the Brooklyn Navy Yard, you can watch it um, in the archive or you can watch it on Facebook. Um, it was really a center of, of important medical uh, innovation, um, different techniques in, in wound irrigation. This shows one of the operating rooms there. Um, this was taken around 1900. Um, it was, of course, used quite extensively during World War I, where so much so that they had to set up these tent encampments and, and treating a lot of people um, who were suffering uh, from the influenza um, epidemic that, that struck the world um, back then. Um, the Brooklyn Naval Hospital was also well known um, for treating patients um, who suffered amputations. They actually developed a lot of techniques um, in physical therapy and occupational therapy. Um, and so here you can see uh, some of their patients uh, showing off uh, their prosthetic legs um, in 1920. So again, just after uh, World War I. Um, and here you can see them doing weaving. Um, they also did things like um, weave rugs and baskets, um, learn to do sewing, uh, and also um, actually manufacture toys um, as a way to treat them and, and teach them how to use them, their, their artificial limbs. Um, so, talking about the cemetery site itself. Um, so the cemetery was actually established in 1831. Um, and so they had burials there all the way up until 1910. 
Um, it's estimated that about 2,000 people uh, were buried um, at that site over the course of its history. We actually don't have any photographs of it as a cemetery. So I'm showing it to you here as just a, a, a overgrown uh, patch, a little bit less than two acres. Um, and so uh, 1831 is when they started doing burials. Um, that went up until 1910. And then in 1926, um, all of the remains were removed. They were disinterred and moved to Cypress Hill Cemetery um, in Queens, the, the national cemetery out there. Um, 1993, the Navy leaves this property um, and they begin the process of turning it over to the city. Um, and as part of that process, they worked uh, with an archaeologist and historian named Joan Geismar, who did a comprehensive survey of the site. And she discovered in the records, as well as in the ground itself, that there was still evidence of human remains, graves that had not been removed from that site. So as a result, this site can never be built on. Um, and so... <clears throat> The Brooklyn Navy Yard in the city of New York had to figure out what to do with this property that is still technically considered hallowed ground. And so to talk about kind of the next stage um, of the life of the Naval Cemetery landscape, um, I am going to bring in um, our guest today, uh, Danielle Knott, uh, who is the uh, coordinator um, of the Naval Cemetery landscape for the Brooklyn Greenway Initiative. So I'm going to bring you on live here in just a second, Danielle. Bear with us for a second. Hey, there you go. Hey, okay, guys. How's it going? Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. I'm really excited to talk to you all about um, the Naval Cemetery landscape. Um, it, like Andrew said, I'm the coordinator there, and we have a small staff that um, engages with visitors. Uh, who are, you know, walking by the site or want to learn more about the history of the space and the meadow. Um, and we are part of the larger organization, Brooklyn Greenway Initiative, which, as Andrew mentioned, um, is responsible for building the greenway along Brooklyn's wall. Um, BGI, as, uh, as an organization, just celebrated its 16th anniversary, at Sweet 16. So over the past decade and a half, we've been working on developing connections and leveraging um, enthusiastic citizens, um, support of uh, local, the local government and private entities to build what will be a 26 mile um, continuous greenway along the waterfront. Right now, currently, about um, 18 miles are finished and another eight miles will be finished in, by 2021, uh, bringing us super close to the final 26 mile um, greenway. Um, and just as a note, um, we, we have been seeing a really huge increase in um, activity along the Greenway in the past couple of weeks. Um, part of the reason why Brooklyn Greenway Initiative was established um, was to develop um, a Greenway that would not only provide um, alternative forms of uh, ac accessible forms of transportation um, to transit star waterfront communities, but also safe space for people like kids or um, cyclists who are um, not as comfortable biking through the streets of New York City along the waterfront um, and provide a sort of calming um, and beautiful resilient waterfront greenway. Um, so as we've all been practicing social distancing and taking um, alternative methods to get to where we need to go, not using public transit in the last week. We've seen a huge increase of users um, along the Brooklyn Greenway. Um, in the past several weeks, over 400%, um, we've seen an over a 400% increase since this time last year. So um, the first week of March, was that we were up 50%, 48% cyclists, 20 more, 20 percent more pedestrians. The second week, week that weekend, we were up 149% cyclists and 50% more pedestrians than the prior week. Um, and then the following week, 90% more cyclists. As you can see, um, the Greenway is used um, by all of Brooklyn to sort of access um, different cultural hubs and, and as an alternative. Um, transport route um, and 
you know, we've seen all these increased numbers in uh, bridge cyclist activity and um, city bikes usage is up 70%. Um, so, you know, we see ourselves as a really important organization um, and bridging all these different communities. Um, in addition- and Oh, sorry, yeah. I was going to say, and that section that we're, that goes past the, the Naval Cemetery landscape, that's already the busiest bike lane in Brooklyn. Yes, right? and since the Greenway has been established down Kent Avenue, that's become like a bike highway, essentially, you know, really connecting the densely populated Williamsburg to the rest of Brooklyn. Um, and a lot of people who use that transportation route um, will pass by the Naval Cemetery landscape on their way to work or back home. Um, and um, we see a lot of people stopping for the first time at the NCL, um, just trying to discover what we have going on over there um, and uh, wanting to learn more. Um, so the, the Naval Cemetery landscape is one of what will hopefully be several green nodes along the Brooklyn Waterfront Greenway. Part of BGI's mission is not only to provide a safe, accessible uh, pedestrian and cyclist route, but to also work with organizations in order to um, create uh, environmental resiliency. So um, in terms of the waterfront, that's, you know, ground swells or um, other sort of stormwater management strategies um, in, from the NC uh, in terms of the NCL, this was really an opportunity to sort of work with um, the Navy Yard and other organizations to be able to make a really historically rich and culturally significant site accessible to the population, to the community, and um, offer what is a park-starved South Williamsburg, um, you know, two acres of really beautiful green space that um, can serve the community and uh, offer a lot of ecological habitat as well. Yeah, and Danielle, I'm just going to pull up the images again of what the space looked like before uh, the Brooklyn Greenway Initiative started building this project. Yeah, so... Yeah, can you tell us a little bit about what, what we're seeing here and, and what some of these plants, what, what you kind of found when you started or when BGI started? Yes, so um, it's funny you can't really even make out the buildings of the naval hospital from this photo but you can see them pretty clearly now today um this photo must have been taken like five six or seven years ago andrew yeah at um, least I, I think i took this in 2013. okay so um before brooklyn greenway initiative um secured the space which was seven years ago um the lot had been the, the cemetery rather had been completely overtaken by invasive species so you can see in this photo a lot of mugwort a lot of mulberry trees there's some milkweed growing as well which is a very um, important plant that we've actually sort of replanted in the space um, for our monarch butterflies uh, but it wasn't really accessible to people um, in, in a way that made sense so it took about two years of um, planning, assessing the site, um, figuring out uh, what exactly a memorial meadow looked like, um, and securing funding through Nature Sacred, which is an organization that builds sort of contemplative green spaces all over the Northeast, um, and some other um, some other uh, organizations, Nelson Bird Waltz, who um, is a landscape uh, architectural firm. Uh, you might be familiar with some of their projects in the city. The Hudson Yards is one of them. Um, and they, this is actually the smallest project that they've ever worked on, um, 1.7 acres, but it was, uh, spoke to them, I guess. And um, their principal architect, Jeffrey Long Henry, um, sort of was able to come into the site and bring in all of the aspects of the site's history, the agricultural history of Brooklyn, the geographical history as it you know, pertains to um, Wallabout Bay, um, and, and also figure out a way to memorialize the remains that were buried there and also um, you know, remain in the ground today. So this photo is, uh, of one of the founders of BGI, Milton. Um, he was instrumental in securing the funding from Major Sacred to um, build the site. So it took about two years of 
um, like I said, planning, but also uh, removing, I don't know how else to say that, um, the invasive species and the unintend unintended um, sort of growth that was there and letting it grow and then, you know, using selective herbicide applications to remove the majority of the invasive species and then bring in over 50,000 native plant plugs and trees um, to the sites to um, build what is essentially there today. So um, this rendering is one of the original um, design plans. Uh, it's changed a little bit in its uh, implementation. Um, there's only the one entrance um, now off Williamsburg Street West, um, and we don't have a greenhouse on the site, but um, in, this is a really great image because it shows some of the key design elements um, in the site. So the, the linear planting that you can make out um, in the meadow area and sort of the middle there, that that planting pattern is so supposed to evoke um, that sort of symmetry, the linear uh, quality that a lot of cemeteries have. If you think about, um, you know, cemeteries or, or war memorials in particular with like a lot, like rows and rows of headstones, they have that sort of um, linear quality to them. And the plantings are supposed to emulate that. Um, with the sort of understanding that over time, those lines will blur as the meadow, um, you know, recedes and continues to sort of shift. Um, so today, when you visit in like June or July, there are some sort of swaths of plantings that still have that linear feel to them, but the majority of it has sort of dispersed and is sort of like a lush um, mass. Um, and Danielle, could yeah. you tell us a little bit about the, the line of, of, uh, of squares, those blocks you see on the left-hand side of the image? Yeah, so um, those uh, stones that connect what is considered the sacred grove, that circular area with the cherry trees in it, um, and the main meadow, those are mooring blocks cut from the Navy Yard and um, are also supposed to, you know, uh, indicate that there are still remains in the site by offering um, an interpreted version of, you know, a tombstone. Um, and as you sort of step off the boardwalk onto those stones, when the meadow is in like full bloom, you kind of have this feeling of immersion, um, like you're, you know, immersed in the meadow. Um, and it's one of the more playful ele elements of the site because you're sort of given the opportunity to hop on these like river stones essentially. Um, and uh, a couple other things I would want to point out is that the, the, the boardwalk itself, um, you can see has sort of like a curve undulating feel to it and that is supposed to um, give folks the feeling of a stream. Um, there were a lot of, this is Walla about Bay, um, obviously, and so there were a lot of like streams that came through this area um, before it was, um, you know, filled. And so you're kind of given that opportunity to walk through like this cut meadow that um, gives it, and, and it has like more of a stream-like quality. Um, and so those are some of the design elements that are really, uh, really um, important in understanding the interpretation of the space. So I want to um, show a couple um, photos to people of, of what the actual construction looked like. So you told us about the removal, and so uh -huh. this is like after removal. So can you tell us what these little gray um, pieces are on the ground here? Yeah, so um, as um, you mentioned, Andrew, um, the, there are still remains in the ground, and so nothing can be built on the site, and we don't do any digging um, or anything like that. And in the actual construction of the um, landscape, everything was very intentional in terms of the routes that um, the machinery took in and out of the access of the site. Those, that fence line is supposed to prohibit people from walking or construction workers from walking um, on areas where they didn't need to be. And the, those um, sort of little uh, gray um, mounds on the ground are actually what is a really ingenious construction system for the boardwalk. Um, those sort of are pillars that have 
um, spikes that go into the ground, which create a load bearing sort of um, uh, support system for the elevated boardwalk. So there, the boardwalk itself um, is raised off of the ground and used as only the support of these um, sort of like diag triangular spikes that go into the um, actual ground of the landscape. So it looks like these were footings that were poured or, or dug and put in place, but they're actually all just sitting on the surface of the ground. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then these images um, pretty clearly show how the construction um, continued to evolve. The boardwalk itself um, is built out of uh, black locust, which is a native tree here in the Northeast um, and, you know, is a really uh, great wood source, um, timber source. Um, so the uh, the the, tr the 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 timber itself was milled by the construction company um, and um, used in the site. We have some black locusts in the hospital annex that you can see from the from the naval cemetery. Um, and then the other image shows sort of that um, linear planting guide. So when they when they brought in all of the plugs um, in that first year of planting, they were able to sort of keep track of the design um, and, and implant them in like a very um, linear fashion. Um, and here is sort of an opportunity to experience what we experience at the Naval Cemetery landscape um, throughout the summer months. Um, this photo kind of shows um, the meadow and it's one of its earlier years um, in full bloom. Um, this amphitheater section of the Naval Cemetery is a really great opportunity to sort of um, bring people together. We do some um, sort of meditative uh, programming throughout the season where we have sound baths and yoga instructors come to do movement work and meditation, guided meditation. Um, but I really enjoy the amphitheater as an opportunity to sort of gaze out onto the meadow and kind of experience all of the life that uh, the meadow supports, all the pollinators, the birds. Um, it's really an, an amazing um, place in the NCL to sort of take in all of the, all of the life that's there. Um, and the native meadow that was planted was done in particular to pay homage to uh, the, the the soldiers, the enlisted officers that were buried here and, and some that still remain as a way of, um, you know, taking a site that used to be uh, specifically just for death, but memorialize them through bringing all this life back into the space and creating this really rich habitat for um, different species. Um, and, and you said that uh, one of the, the key funders for this was the sacred spaces, is that right? Yeah, the Nature Sacred Foundation, the TKF Foundation, they um, work in particular to fund uh, green spaces uh, that are, you know, pretty contemplative, um, but exist in urban centers. So they are based out of D.C. and um, work primarily in the Northeast to fund these sort of small, um, like you said, green oases. Um, all of their sites feature a uh, bench that uh, kind of tells the story of the foundation and also has a journal tucked underneath it that people can write their thoughts, um, you know, engage with each other, um, you know, write down any emotions, poetry, drawings, anything that kind of comes to their mind um, while being in the space. And those journals, once they're full, get sent to the Nature Sacred Foundation's headquarters where they're um, documented and archived and um, are all part of a larger project on understanding um, the sort of impact that green spaces have on city dwellers because they're, you know, they still walking around the NCL, you'll, there are all these health benefits that you are able to experience. Your heart rate slows, um, you know, you're breathing fresh air, you're able to slow down your breathing, um, and it's just a really nice reset for your mental health. Um, and so Nature Sacred tries to um, show all of that, all, all of their work through these journal entries. So, so that sounds like something that a lot of us need right now, yeah. but 
we're also very, you know, aware of, you know, shutting down public spaces and trying to reduce public gatherings. So, so mm -hmm. what's the status of the Naval Cemetery landscape um, right, right now? Uh, currently, we remain open on Saturdays and Sundays from 10 to 4. Um, we are, uh, as staff, um, very aware of um, the recommendations, um, the, uh, the, the, the guidelines around social distancing and not gathering um, outside. So most of our visitation, and this is year round, um, is, you know, individuals or couples that come to the site. We have, we don't do um, or, you know, experience a lot of group gatherings and um, you know, we get coined often as a hidden gem. This is not necessarily a destination for a lot of people. Um, it's a newer park. We're going to our fifth season. So it's still not on a lot of people's radars. Um, so most of the time there's, um, you know, only a handful of people in the two acre park at any given time of day, um, which is great. It allows people to spread out. Um, there are things to look at and explore all over the space all over the park, um, all over the landscape. So um, if you come um, all alone, we ask that you respect everyone's um, um, personal space and remain you know, at least six feet away from everyone. Um, we have been actively sort of um, conveying that message to our visitors, um, but also recognize that this is a really important space, like you said, um, during times of like heightened anxiety for people to come and just relax and take some deep breaths. Yeah. So we, we just talked about how people use the space. Could you tell us a little bit about how some other animals other than humans uh, enjoy this space? Yes, yeah, so um, this is a great photo shot of um, some of our bird visitors. Uh, we have kestrels that come and like to perch on the posts that are on, along the perimeter of the park. Um, was it, we haven't really mentioned it, but for a short period of time, the, the Naval Cemetery was actually turned into a ball field. And so the, the large posts that are along the perimeter used to hold like the stadium lights. Um, and it was uh, decided, we just, they, it was, um, the decision was made to leave the posts up when um, the Naval Cemetery landscape was being built because um, they offer a really great perch for birds of prey. So we've, you know, we've seen American kestrels um, eat up there and, you know, scout for prey. Uh, we have a family of red-tailed hawks that lives in the Navy Yard and they will come and perch at dusk. Um, a lot of uh, like woodpeckers um, like to hang out on them. Um, so the site is a really, is a really great home for um, songbirds, migratory birds. We have a large population of robins, cardinals. Um, it's kind of a nice spot to, to come to if you are um, a fan of bird watching. Um, and in addition to that, we also support a really robust native bee population. So- And, um, and Danielle, before we yeah. dive into the bees at the Naval Cemetery landscape, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your own connection to bees. Yeah, um, so I actually became involved with the Naval Cemetery landscape because um, I'm an urban beekeeper and about five years ago I was ha uh, maintaining some hives in a friend's backyard and we ran into a problem where their neighbors who were originally comfortable with the idea of bees became uncomfortable after we installed them and we were looking for a place to sort of relocate our hives um, and I became in contact with BGI and they sort of offered the, um, the landscape up to me um, as, a, as a sort of apiary site. So I've maintained beehives there now for five years um, and have been able to see the NCL, you know, grow into what it is today, which is amazing. Um, and my own understanding of bees in the urban setting, I should say, um, has really evolved too uh, because honeybees, um, are generalists and they're able to forage on everything, whereas most native bees have evolved to be able to forage um, only on a couple different, a uh, smaller portion of species um, available. So honeybees can sort of be seen as an, as an invasive species. So um, I've tried to uh, really deepen my understanding of the native bee population at the NCL and figure out ways that we can sort of support a habitat uh, or develop a habitat that support, supports both honeybees and the native bee population there. And you've made some surprising discoveries, right? Yes, so um, 
this past year, we have really taken a, um, a hard turn towards creating ecological awareness about the NCL and what it offers, even though it's only 1.7 acres. Um, you know, in this part of Brooklyn, that's a uh, green space that's hard to come by. So it's sort of become as an oasis for humans, also an oasis for a lot of insects and birds. Um, and we worked uh, last year with uh, a bee biologist, Sarah Kornbluth, who is out, uh, works primarily with the American Muse Museum of Natural History. Um, she and I were actually both interviewed for a Chinese news segment on urban beekeeping, um, and so became connected that way. She came to the NCL and helped us do some sort of preliminary data collection on what species of native bees we were supporting. So there's Greg and I netting um, some bees, and uh, what Sarah found is really exciting. We not only host um, a diversity of native bees, but also parasitic bees, which um, only uh, are found in areas where the their sort of host um, the 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 bee that they're parasitic to, where those nesting habit habitats are um, really 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 um, strong. So we support enough native bee populations to also support their parasitic equivalent, which is pretty cool. Um, and we've adapted our ecological sort of maintenance, um, our landscaping strategies to um, reflect how we can support um, more native bees. So um, Sarah has become, um, you know, really excited about this landscape and um, most of her recent work has been at Greenwood Cemetery and at the Highline, but she's now a member of our advisory committee um, and is, has had um, a huge impact on um, helping us develop long-term strategies um, in landscape management for the space that will um, help us move away from using any herbicides um, in the parks for controlling of, um, of invasive species. So it's really cool to learn about how this like really sort of small space can support such a diversity of um, insects. Um, another animal I wanted to, to mention, maybe you can tell us a little bit about this, and it's maybe an animal that people have seen, even if you've just walked by or driven by in your bike, uh, which is um, not a native species, but cats. Yes. <laughs> yes. So most recently, because of the construction that's been going on at the Naval Hospital Annex, um, we have started to see a lot of, we have seen um, more frequent visitations of the Navy Yard's beloved cats. Um, you know, we don't offer any sort of support for um, the, the, the Navy Yard's cat population, but um, they are welcome to roam in the, in the NCL, and obviously they keep, help keep the rodents at bay. Um, but we also, you know, see uh, raccoons coming through there. Um, we, uh, you know, uh, yeah, we're home to a lot of different species. So, you yeah. know, I think that like, we have the, the, so the songbirds and the smaller bird, birds that live there, um, you know, they have their, like any ecosystem, have their natural predators, so. Yeah, and just uh, to, to, to your point, um, I should just mention that the cats at the Navy Yard are not the official, the, the, these are not the official cats of the Brooklyn Navy Yard, <laughs> the feral cat population that's been established for a long time. And we actually do have a, a great group of, of volunteers that helps, um, to take care of them and make sure that they're spayed and neutered and, and healthy and things like that. Um, but what you referenced before to the construction, I should just say, because I, I didn't say it at the beginning, you know, we, we talked about the Naval Hospital um, and how it's a landmark building, it's not going to go anywhere, mm -hmm. but the 24 acre campus um, that was the hospital is now part of Steiner Studios, the, the movie and television studio at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So they're doing construction um, as they expand up onto that site um, and repurpose um, a lot of the historic buildings up there. So. Um, yeah, I don't know if you want to tell us a little bit about some of the some of the the plantings. You already mentioned um, what was there before. Um, uh -huh. What are some of the things that you put in? Um, yeah, so um, uh, the design of, uh, or I should say, something that's really common in a lot of the landscape firm Nelson Bird Waltz, a lot of their projects is the use of native species, and we've kind of seen that become more in vogue um, from a landscape architecture perspective. You know, Brooklyn Bridge Park has really taken um, sort of uh, 
a lot of has, has garnered a lot of attention because of their use of and their establishment of a lot of native species back to the waterfront and so we like to think of ourselves as part of that larger community of being like a, a native um, native habitat so all of the plants that you see up here um, these are all native species from the northeast um, and they were planted uh, or this variety was of plants was planted specifically because they offer all they all offer um, benefits to pollinators. Um, you know, we have you can see the monarch butterfly um, in on, in one of these photos, and we have recently become a monarch way station, um, designated monarch way station by Monarch Watch because of our abundance of nectar rich annuals and um, the amount of uh, different milkweed species we have, um, and. These plants um, are interesting when they're in bloom, obviously, but a lot of these species were also chosen because they're sort of structurally interesting in the winter time. Um, so we like to think of ourselves as a four season park because meadows are, you know, four seasons. They offer, um, you know, really important habitat in the winter for cavity nesting bees. Um, the grasses and sedges that were planted at the NCL offer um, habitat for ground nesting, uh, birds, bumblebees, bumblebees in particular like to build their nests at the bases of sedges, like little really grassy um, mounds and sort of burrow in there. Um, so all of these planting, all of these species of plants, um, you know, have several benefits. Um, and, and we love that they're all native plants because they allow for native populations of bees and birds to sort of, uh, to, to be revived. We, we had a question uh, from an attendee, which is what, what happens to the honey back to the bees? What happens to the honey that oh. is produced at the Naval Cemetery landscape? That's a great question. Um, so there's a, I think there's like, there are some myths about urban beekeeping. Um, urban beekeepers definitely do not, are not able to produce as much honey as, you know, commercial beekeepers or, um, you know, mid-sized beekeeping operations in upstate New York. Um, so my bee uh, hives, I only have uh, at any given time, like two to three hives at the NCL. Um, they produce enough honey for themselves to overwinter. So an overwinter, a hive overwintering in the Northeast needs about 90 pounds of honey to get it through sort of the nectar dearth that is winter and early spring. Um, and so I, I'm only harvesting anything that's in excess of 90 pounds. And sometimes that's only you know, 20 to 30 pounds of honey. Um, and I try to be particular about what the honey is used for. Um, this last year we harvested the honey and it was used in a cocktail at our uh, annual gala, Green Bay Plus Industry. So we partnered with Kings County Distillery, which is also in the Navy Yard, um, to come up with a cool spiced cocktail that used my honey, or my bees honey. Um, and then this year, um, the honey that I harvested from the hives at the NCL is going to be used uh, for the revival of their, of Kings County Distillery's Honey Moonshine. Um, so kind of keeping it in the Navy Yard, um, you know, trying to support other local businesses. Um, but there isn't too much honey harvested in, in any given year. So um, I try to either keep it for the bees or find other local organizations to partner with. Mm -hmm. Great. So we're, we're almost out of time here, Danielle, but I, I did okay. want to um, give you the opportunity to tell us a little bit about uh, some of the programming um, at cool. the landscape. Yeah. So, you know, uh, who knows how long we'll be, um, you know, quarantined, I guess, but uh, in the past and hopefully this season at NCL, we'll continue to do um, our uh, programming around um, youth education, wellness, and citizen science. Um, this is an image from a, a workshop that was done by one of our partner organizations, City Growers, um, which is a nonprofit based in the Navy Yard that um, uh, helps to educate like youth K through 12 on um, ecology um, and urban agriculture. Uh, so they do summer camp activities at the, at the Naval Cemetery landscape to learn about um, the native species that are planted there and how ecosystems work. Um, and they also offer a really amazing high school aged or um, high school opportunity uh, opportunity for high schoolers who are interested in beekeeping and entrepreneurship to learn about beekeeping, um, how to you know essentially start your own beekeeping business, what the 
economic opportunities are in beekeeping um, and also green jobs training um, in, in the, um, in the for sort of uh, landscaping field by um, partnering with us to do some invasive species removal of the landscape. So they're one of our partner organizations um, in addition to several others that we work with throughout the season. And oh yeah, and here is Jeffrey Long Henry, who is the principal architect at Nelson Birdwoltz, giving a, dis a talk on um, the the design um, of the Naval Cemetery landscape and the history of the site, just like we're kind of doing today. Um, and uh, this was in uh, this was in a part of Jane's Walk, which um, is a really cool. Um, activity that happens where you kind of get to learn about your your neighborhood a little bit more. Um, so Jeffrey gave everyone a little bit of insider information on the development of the NCL. It's the Naval Cemetery in the summertime. You can see there's just like a large there's a diversity of plants that come into bloom throughout the season. So if you come back in June and August, October, you'll see a totally different landscape. Um, it's continually evolving, which is important for pollinators because they need food all year long. So here it is in June, um, the pathway, you can see the posts that uh, the, the birds like to perch on um, overlooking the meadow. And the fall is really beautiful at the NCL. We have some um, maples, some oaks, the cherry trees um, all sort of have really beautiful fall colors. Um, and the plants as they start to sort of die back take on that like really interesting architectural um, layered look. So any season you come is really beautiful and striking. And in winter it is great to sort of take a little snow day in the NCL. We remain open on snow days and uh, it's kind of a fun, you know, snowy walk, um, which makes you feel like very far away from the rest of New York City on a snow day, so. <laughs> great, well, Danielle, thank you so much. Um, we're, we're just about out of time. I don't know if there's anything else you wanna add. I just put up here on the screen, um, you can see ways that you can connect with the Brooklyn Greenway Initiative, um, with the Naval Cemetery Landscape, um, through their website and on Twitter and Instagram. Is there anything else that you want to you want to add and share with us? Um, yeah, just that um, you know the NCL, like as I said, remains a place for people to come to um, sort of. Uh, meditate and contemplate be a little bit um, introspective during these um, sort of stressful times so we like I said remain open on the weekends and we'll hopefully switch to a five day a week schedule shortly so keep um, keep up to date with our hours by going online at, to brooklyngreenway.org and following us on Instagram um, and um, we are also launching a stewardship program this year. So um, stewardship program for the entire Greenway, which allows people to get involved um, in, within their local community um, and, and steward the sort of green spaces that BGI has built um, in different waterfront communities that have a lot of these plants planted um, and trees that need tree care. So just, you know, come and uh, find out way, more ways to get involved and we will see you on the Greenway. <laughs> yeah, and we just had a question here, um, yep. which was about different events. I know it's really hard to predict what events you're gonna be able to participate in, but you know, Jane's Walk is, is up in the air. That's the first weekend in, in May, um, but right. you also participate in events, for example, with uh, Open House New York. Um, yeah, Open House New York um, in the fall is always nice. Um, hopefully by um, June we're able to be a little bit more uh, um, out and about and can do some larger gatherings, which is uh, when our season opener is slated to begin, uh, slated to happen at the end of June. Uh, most of our programming takes place sort of in the summer months when kids are out of school. Um, Thursday evenings is when we do our yoga and sound bath uh, meditation. So. Um, like I said, stay up to date with uh, on Twitter and Instagram to find out more about those schedules. But um, you know, we offer a variety of citizen science programming, um, uh, 
contemplative programming um, and kids activities throughout the season. So just, yeah, be in touch and we'll keep you posted on what we've got going on. Great. Well, Danielle, thank you so much for sharing. This is really amazing. And I hope everybody who joined us today, if you haven't been to the Naval Cemetery landscape, that you get the opportunity um, to go out there when the, when the time is right. Or if you, if you live nearby in, in South Williamsburg, um, you know, you can, you can step in. Um, it looks like it's maybe going to be open this weekend still, but again, things are changing day to day. Um, but I want to thank you so much, Danielle.